Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us for The Way Forward, the President's Speaker Series of Quinnipiac University. I'm Dr. Kalila Brown-Dean, Associate Professor of Political Science and Senior Director for Inclusive Excellence. And it is my honor to moderate today's discussion about the impact of the pandemic on the economically vulnerable. We have a fantastic group of panelists who will share their insights but really have a conversation about the way forward and how we understand where we are today and where we want to go. So rather than reading their very extensive and distinguished bios, we thought that we would have our panelists share with you how their work speaks to these issues. And so our first guest today, we're very excited to have with us, is Arunan Aralampalo, who is Deputy Commissioner of the Connecticut Department of Consumer Protection and perhaps most importantly, is a 2014 graduate of the Quinnipiac School of Law. Arunan, thank you for joining us today. Thank you, Clyda. No problem, good to see you. We also have Eric Clements, President and CEO of the Connecticut Center for Arts and Technology, commonly known as CONCAT. Eric, thanks for being with us. Oh, thanks for having me, Dr. Brown Dean. Thank you. And finally, we have Will Ginsburg, President and CEO of the Community Foundation for Greater New Haven. Will, it's good to see you again. Delilah, it's good to see you again as always, and I'm delighted to be with you all. Thank and I you. apologize Thank for not having a Quinnipiac. We'll, we'll work on that. We'll work on the connection. So Arunan, I actually want to start with you. And I want to start, you gave the commencement address in 2014 for the School of Law. And with a little bit of internet digging, I found this quote from your speech, and I want us to start here. You said in 2014, we are entering an increasingly anxious world, a world that's anxious about its future, where it's going, how it's going to get there, and the obstacles that lay in its way. This is an America where more and more Americans believe that the nation 20 years from now and 50 years from now will be worse than the one that they inherited. You said that in 2014, and here we are in 2020 talking about that anxiety and that uncertainty. So talk to us about your role as deputy commissioner and as a public servant in addressing some of that anxiety and really advocating on behalf of the vulnerable. Yeah, thank you, and, and thanks for having me. And, and that's it's some impressive digging. I don't, I don't know that I've seen that speech in a little bit. Um, you know, I, I'm at the Department of Consumer Protection, and I'm probably the one panelist here who, whose job doesn't explicitly deal with economically vulnerable communities. Um, and so I'd, I'd like to, if I can, address that briefly, both professionally and personally. Um, but you know, at the Department of Consumer Prote Protection, we're, we're a large regulatory agency. We regulate food and drugs and liquor and gaming and, and occupational professional licensing. But what we're probably best known for is being an advocate and, and uh, enforcing uh, consumer protection violations um, on, on behalf of consumers against against business entities, and we re realized, and I, I can't take any credit for me for uh, this. This is in the last administration that we do a really good job when consumers come to us, uh, but the types of consumers that come to us tend to be those who are more economically advantaged, tend to be those who uh, are are whiter and 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 uh, of so certain socioeconomic status and and have been in this country for a while. And um, we have tried to figure out how we can get messages out and, and reach out to economically disadvantaged communities who uh, feel all forms of anxiety. One of those is interacting with the government uh, who, who may not trust uh, government interactions uh, for good reason. And, and so we have done a lot of work on, on that uh, front that uh, has been e even more so uh, important and, uh, and essential during COVID. Um, and I, I'd be happy to speak to that. The other uh, way in which this impacts me is in my own community. I live in the south end of Hartford um, in a community that before COVID had great unemployment rates at Great Depression levels uh, and had, you know, 60, over 60% 60 of the kids who grew up in my neighborhood grew up in a single family home at 125% of the poverty line. Over half of the housing units are government subsidized housing units. Um, and and so I've I've seen firsthand the kind of anxiety um, that this this has created, but more than anxiety, the real substantive 
issues that it has created in families and communities. Uh, and, and I realize the privilege that I have, you know, I, you can probably see I'm, I'm currently in an RV somewhere in Colorado. We took a trip with our kids. Um, and I can, I'm able to get out of that, um, uh, whatever bubble I'm in. I know that how difficult this pandemic has been for so many families and so many of my friends from various socioeconomic communities. But for my neighbors who I see in multi-generational housing units um, that are small and cooped up, uh, and I know with my kids how difficult it is to keep them cooped up in my house, uh, the impact of that for, for folks who have never really had meaningful health care, um, the anxiety that that produces for folks who have been working two or three jobs just to make ends meet, um, and now one or two or all of those jobs are not available, and they're wondering if unemployment benefits are going to run out. Um, those are very real concerns that have very deep impacts and will be felt for generations. Um, and so that, that's, uh, you know, in many ways, uh, the, the lens that is more important to me, I think, coming to this conversation. I think it's an important reminder, Runan, that for many people, social distancing is a privilege and a luxury that they simply don't have access to, whether it's because of their living situation, or as you mentioned, having these multi-generational family units and spaces that make it very difficult to keep people safe and continue to provide for your family. Eric, I wanna continue in that vein, because when we talk about what it means to be economically vulnerable during this time of pandemic, it is often different from how we traditionally define being economically vulnerable. And the work that you do at CONCAT is really about centering the voices and the experiences of people for whom that uncertainty is a constant. So this wasn't new for many families and communities, but it deepened what already existed. Talk to us about the work that you're doing at CONCAT, but also in the community more broadly to continue to elevate those voices. Yeah, again, thank you. And I'm, I'm a little disappointed you didn't look for one of my speeches. Um, um, I did a commencement speech too, but it's okay. Um, it's coming, it's coming <laughs> I'm playing, I'm playing. Um, Again, uh, thank you, Dr. Brown Dean. Yeah, so at CONCAT, you know, I'm founding CEO and president, uh, founded the organization along with Carlton Highsmith um, in 2011, built it for a year. And it's kind of three tracks. One is workforce development. And so we partner with Yale New Haven Hospital being the largest employer in New Haven asked them what is immediate need and market relevant in terms of their workforce. Um, they indicated they needed phlebotomists and medical billers and coders. And so we designed training programs based on that feasibility. And then we have an arts after school and summer program because we wanna use arts as a vehicle for academic achievement. And then thirdly, we partner with Quinnipiac University, their school of business um, to build an entrepreneurship academy, which is now statewide. Um, after a couple of years, Kalila, we, we looked at our workforce development um, and realized that we had not done a good job of addressing the issue of reentry in our, our medical training programs. And so we built a culinary school with a social enterprise whereby our students run a restaurant after they graduate. Um, and 40% of those students are folks who have been incarcerated at some point or another. So we're creating second chances. Now, because of the success of CONCAT, um, we looked at what we could do because there's a critical mass of students or graduates who are now living in New Haven who have these, this inspiration and these dreams of owning a home or starting a business. So we then started this new organization, we being myself and Mr. Highsmith, called Concorp. And what we endeavored to do there is real economic development and social impact in communities of poverty, namely Dixwell and New Hallville. Now, we, what we've done, and you know this well, we've taken an eight acre track of land called Dixwell Plaza. We've, re, we've um, um, looked at it, we've studied it, we've programmed that site, looking at what that community needs. And then we looked at re, kind of redesigning that space. And so, that's what we've been doing. We've acquired 70% of the properties on the plaza. We're gonna build 150 units of housing, 300 seat performing arts center, a 50,000 square foot commercial building, retail spaces, 15 restaurant food hall, um, a gym, a supermarket, an early childhood center. All the things that the community indicated that is a serious need 
of that community. Now, while doing that, COVID hit, and we had to pivot our efforts from workforce development and arts programming to address the immediate needs of the people um, where we knew the people were suffering already because of poverty and, and because of race. And at some point, we, we really need to dig into the issue of race in this, especially as it relates to economic vulnerability. And we then launched a fund. We raised about $580,000 in about eight, nine days to do uh, direct service to folks who were struggling with food insecurity, struggling with paying a light bill because they were they're now living in the dark with no no um, electricity, struggling with heat, struggling with clothes, all of these things. And so for the last three to four months, we've given, given out about $360,000 of relief to about 700 to 780 families in Dixwell and Newhallville. Um, and so those are some of the things that we had to do in terms of pivoting to address the serious needs and really unmet needs of people who have lived in poverty for a long time and quite frankly look like me. One of the things that I appreciate about what you said, Eric, is that this challenge in terms of the impact of the pandemic didn't happen overnight. We didn't get here overnight. And what it's going to take to move people beyond that vulnerability will be much longer than an immediate step or an overnight. And I think, Will, that really sets up nicely your work at the Community Foundation. Now, now in full disclosure, I serve as chair of the board of directors of the Community Foundation, so I may be a bit biased there, <laughs> but it's okay. Well, the foundation released this statement about a, a month ago called a call to community. And it really was about how do we address the dual pandemics of COVID-19 and racism that has deepened and concentrated economic vulnerability in particular communities. And yet the foundation is often in a position as a philanthropic organization of working with people who are very economically secure in order to address challenges facing those who are not. So talk to us about your role as leading a philanthropic organization, in particular community foundation, and of understanding, as Eric mentioned, you know, the things that have led up to this moment and also structurally what can be done to get people through, but also to get people toward a more prosperous way forward. Well, thank you, Kalila. And again, uh, sorry, I, I, uh, I, I fell off, but I'm back hopefully, uh, hopefully until two o'clock at least. Um, uh, so just a word about the Community Foundation. I, I have been uh, CEO of the Community Foundation for almost uh, 20 years now. Uh, and this is an old organization. Uh, it goes back, uh, founded 1928. It has been the community's uh, foundation, the community's endowment uh, for 92 years. Uh, and it has changed and grown as the community has changed and as the community's needs have changed. Uh, and today it's an organization, uh, we have assets, total assets of something over $650 million. It's a substantial, uh, it's a substantial uh, a resource and it's a tribute to three generations of generosity in our community. Uh, I will say, uh, having said that, my 20 years, 92 year history of the organization, uh, this pandemic uh, and the experience of the last four months, I, I would say has been unlike anything that we've experienced before. It has changed fundamental, it has reinforced some of the fundamental uh, dynamics in our community around economic vulnerability, and it has changed the fundamental dynamics in our community around economic vulnerability. Um, the, uh, what do I mean by that? Uh, I think one of the most striking things about COVID-19 is the, uh, the, the utterly inescapable uh, uh, and bold uh, racial disparities and ethnic disparities that exist in how COVID-19 has impacted uh, the people of our community and indeed the people of our country. Um, the, the, the health impacts, the economic impacts uh, on people of color are dramatically uh, more uh, severe than on the population in general. Um, at some level, uh, we shouldn't be surprised by that, uh, given the history of race and racial oppression uh, and, and, and disadvantage in, in our country. Uh, but COVID-19 has brought it out with a clarity, I think, that 
perhaps wasn't there before. A clarity that needed that needed to be brought out. Um, at the same time, uh, COVID-19 has created a whole new class of vulnerable in our community. Um, the, uh, in fact, I was on NewYorkTimes.com an hour ago. The lead, uh, by the big lead story today is the second quarter uh, economic decline, by far the largest on record. Our national economy declined almost 33% in terms of uh, output in the second quarter, by far the largest ever. Um, the unemployment rate, uh, there have been more than a million new claims filed, unemployment claims filed for 19 weeks in a row. Um, and supplemental unemployment that the federal government provided in March ends tomorrow. So there is, uh, and we've seen this in our work. We raised uh, close to $3 million. You were directly uh, involved in, in the decisions about how to distribute that to Lila back in April and May and June. And, uh, and we're planning for the next tranche of this now going forward uh, into the fall. Uh, but what we saw was basic needs from a large swath of the population people who'd been who'd had these needs forever and population groups that we'd seen these needs forever and others that didn't you know we ended up spending most of that initial tranche on basic needs and and what do i mean by that starts with food people who couldn't families who couldn't afford the food they needed to keep uh to keep themselves and their children fed so uh and it's much more widespread than it was before uh and i don't think it's uh it's uh, coming back in the same way, we can talk more about that. So, you know, the last thing I'll say about that is, again, under your leadership, Kalila, the foundation produced a new strategic plan last year, focusing on creating opportunity. This is pre-COVID. Uh, the board approved it uh, last December, uh, and focusing on how we grow and how we grow inclusively, so that we can create opportunity for all in Greater New Haven. Well, indeed, the need for growth, given the state of the economy, and the need for inclusion. Uh, given how this has impacted so disparately on people of color, uh, is more is more evident now than ever. So part of my approach to this and part of the foundation's approach to this is about is about the economic growth side, and that's my own background. My own background is in economic development as a uh, in in the nonprofit sector and in the federal government and in the and in local government, going back a long way. So so that's that's the, an approach I take. It's about meeting needs. And it's about economic change and economic growth so that uh, we're prepared uh, as we come out of COVID for a very different world. Thank you, Will. I'd like to remind our participants and also the audience that if you have questions, you can put them into the Q&A box and our staff will feed them to me and we'll try to include that as much as possible. So thank you again to all of our panelists. Arunan, as a political scientist, I often say that people hate government until they need government. And during this pandemic, we have witnessed greater demands for government accountability, but also for government support. And at the same time, we're seeing declining revenues in a lot of areas because of all of the measures that have been necessary to simply keep people safe. What do you say to business owners who now feel more economically vulnerable, to small business owners who may not have qualified for the PPP loans or are now faced with the decision, do we stay open and struggle or do we shut down? You know, what should the role of government be in all of this, given what you do in terms of, of you know, consumer protection, but also your work with small businesses? Yeah, thanks for that. Um, you know, I, I often say, and, uh, you know, I know, I know that at least Will has been involved in, in federal government at some, uh, at a very high level, but to, to me as an outside observer, at times it feels like we lack uh, perspective and, and uh, impetus more than resources. And, you know, when 9-11 when happened, it was, it was a horrible tragedy. 3,000 people lost their lives, and we spent, as a, as a nation, two and a half trillion dollars to, as, as that administration saw it at the time, ensure that this wouldn't happen again. And we can debate whether that was the best method for that to happen, but two and a half trillion dollars, I don't, I don't think anybody blinked an eye on how much we were spending. I mean, we, we debated the tactics maybe, but it was, there wasn't a debate uh, because of the level of that attack. Now we're approaching 
almost 50 times the casualties of 9-11. And, uh, and as you've stated, I think very eloquently, Kyla, uh, you know, these issues, the issues that have been the, the fuel on the fire of COVID in this country uh, are social issues, not, not purely biological and, and medical issues, they're social issues. And, and I, you know, I wonder and whether we are going to be able to muster the same resources to address the social issues that exist um, and, and the very real economic issues that exist. And, uh, and you know, I, I think that um, to, to those small businesses, uh, it's, it's a really, really difficult time. I mean, people invest their lives and their dreams and their visions uh, and the, the amount of sweat equity can never be made up. Uh, and, uh, and, and they face some really difficult challenges and difficulties now. And I think it's so imperative on all of us to look with clear eyes at um, those who are on the margins. I think for so long, it has been so easy to ignore those who are on the margins because they live in these portions of our society. Sometimes we call them inner cities that, that we don't visit, we don't travel to, uh, and we don't see. But one of the blessings that has come out of this horrible pandemic is for, I think, a majority of Americans, we've been able to feel and touch a piece of what it's like to be vulnerable in this society. We've, we've felt what it's like to have to balance work duties and raising a child at the same time without any help. We felt what it's like to not know whether your health care is going to be sufficient to save your life if it comes down to that. We've know, we know it's like to have economic uncertainty for so many of us. And I hope that we, we take that experience and build it into a national compassion um, and a national uh, uh, understanding of each other that, that permeates uh, in, in the time going forward as we rebuild our society. Because I think it's so essential that, that we, we take that, that moment of, of vulnerability and instead of pushing it down and ignoring it, like, like we are so prone to do, I think, as humans, that we use it to empathize with those whose lives have been that. Um, and we use our resources to create a society and build a society in which as, as the wealthiest nation in the world, we say it's unacceptable uh, for that level of vulnerability to exist in good times, let alone bad times. Um, and and, and I, I think it in, involves, it requires a national response from all of us. There's something incredibly humbling, Arunan, about realizing that many of us started this year thinking that we were very comfortable or secure and then realizing almost in an instant how that vulnerability set can set in but also change not just what you value but also how you operate and, and so i think your point about what do we learn from this and what do we take away from this as we chart the way forward is important for all of us regardless if we are entrepreneurs and small business owners or not so thank you uh, eric since you brought up the point about digging up past speeches, I want to mention a letter that you wrote. And in the letter to potential donors, so you mentioned this effort about uh, raising over $580,000 for these vulnerable communities. And so in the letter you said, we are committed to proclaim the power of justice through service and through a concerted effort to exact the wrongs of poverty. So say more about why you feel that addressing the impact of COVID and, and other pandemics on the economically vulnerable is a moral imperative. So what's the connection between that economic vulnerability that we're seeing and some of the other manifestations of challenge that are really beset upon particular communities? Yeah, I, I, again, thanks, Kalila. I think, again, what, what COVID did was lay bare the suffering of black and brown poor communities. Um, in a way where white folks or systems of oppression, those who are benefited from systems of, of oppression, can, um, cannot look away and or run away. And so what you saw in an instance was folks trying to su su survive COVID, right? Now, in, as the world watched, while at the same time, Black men continuously being killed by police with really no retribution at all. So all of this was going on at the same time. And so, you know, when George Floyd was killed, to me, it was a representation of especially the black community with, its, with someone white 
me on their neck, choking them out. And so what I was saying there was, it is not only enough to march and protest and work for the benefit of justice, but we also have to march, protest, and fight for power at the same time. And, and I, I felt like, you know, as, as we were protesting, marching, working through the issues and disparities wrought by COVID um, and the issue that George Floyd's death brought to, to, to light, which I've dealt with all my life. I've strategized all my life to stay alive. I've strategized all my life to get home. And so those, the, the confluence of those things just made folks fed up, especially young people. And so again, what I was saying there is it is not enough to fight for justice. We have to fight for justice for and power with. And at the same time, hold white folks especially accountable, especially those who have benefited from this system of oppression and racism in a way that people of color have not. Not only have we not benefited, we have regressed. And so that's really what I was, was saying here. And I don't think, quite frankly, it is said enough and said consistently enough. Eric, I want to follow up on that with a question from the audience. And that is, do you sense that something is different in the response now to this pandemic? And as Arunan mentioned, the fact that there are social dimensions to this pandemic that are not purely about health. That in conjunction with the uprisings we've seen across the country over um, police brutality and violence. Do you, do you sense something different that perhaps will get to those different outcomes about justice and power? Absolutely. Or oh, I'm sorry. Oh, no. Absolutely, Kalila. Um, and I'll give you hopefully a salient example. I, I met Arunin uh, last year or a year and a half ago in Governor Lamont's transition, we were on a committee and it was a committee full of, of, of white guys. And they were, we were talking about economic strategies and, and all these things. And I remember, and Arun, and correct me if I'm wrong, I was so outspoken because no one was talking about poverty. I said, how can we have these strategies and these economic formulas without addressing poverty? And I, Arun and heard me, that's how we began to talk. And we would talk offline, but here we are right, having now to address the issue of poverty. And I will say, um, and I shared this with Will a couple weeks ago, it's different because I think there is a haunting tension, especially for white people, between self-preservation and self-discovery, right? People now have a choice and the world has given them a choice. You can either stay the same, pretend that you do not see what is going on, you do not realize or do you know, or 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 just resist the idea of realizing that you have benefited from a system of oppression and racism, or you can dig deep and honestly interrogate yourself and your life in a way where you truly see who you are. And I believe that when people can truly see who they are, especially if they are white, they can then see who I am. There is no way you can see the suffering of black people without truly seeing your position in it. And so I, I feel like there are so many allies who do not look like me, who are really trying to discover who they are, where they fit in this, and what they could do to make the world a better place. It, it, not only does it look different, for speaking as a Black man who has dealt with it all his life, it feels very different to me. Thank you, Eric. You're welcome. Well, there's a lot of interventions happening at the local level, the federal level, the state level, um, that those interventions are designed to help people who are vulnerable. And often navigating those interventions can become a challenge in and of itself. And yet the thing that keeps you and I up at night, and we talk about this frequently, is the realization that some organizations may not survive this pandemic in spite of those resources. Talk about how you reconcile that tension, that there is tremendous need that there are some resources and still often those who are most vulnerable or in greatest need don't have the access that they need to really not just survive, but to thrive and, and flourish. 
Well, I think that's right, Kalila, and we've seen that actually very clearly in COVID. I mean, step back and think about what's happened over the last four months. In terms of resources, this goes, was, goes to what Arunan was saying. I mean, the federal government has really stepped forward in a way that is unlike anything we've seen in decades. Um, trillions of dollars uh, related to COVID, to individuals and families, to small businesses. Um, uh, so the federal government has stepped forward. Uh, that said, I would quickly say that it has not been focused on specifically on the vulnerable populations that we're talking about. Um, yes, of course, the, the $600 uh, in supplemental unemployment insurance, uh, yes, that's income limited, et cetera, but it has not been specifically focused. And the, 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 uh, the small business assistance funding is, a good ex is, is perhaps uh, the best example of that. Of course, right now, there's a debate going on in the US Senate about whether there's gonna be a, a next phase of this and the issues about uh, does, is, will there be a next phase? And if so, who will benefit from it? And specifically, will the, will the economically and socially vulnerable uh, benefit from it is very, very clearly on the table. Um, and the kind of bipartisan majorities that existed in March and April to appropriate trillions of dollars for COVID relief does not exist right now. And the House is, the Democratic controlled House is in a totally different place than the Republican controlled Senate. So this issue is being is being debated in our in our Congress right now. I would say in terms of these resources that the federal government is the place where the, the only play, the only uh, the only place in our system that can come up with the kind of resources that are needed here. Philanthropy clearly has a role and it's something you and I uh, work together on very closely. And what you say is right that that the nonprofit infrastructure that has grown up over time in New Haven, in Greater New Haven, in Connecticut, and around the country uh, to support and service uh, the vulnerable in our society in many different ways is facing an existential crisis as a result of COVID. I think the likes of which it has, it has, it has never seen. Uh, it has grown dramatically over the last 30 or 40 years and has never faced this kind of crisis. Um, and I would say that's particularly true at the community level because, you know, the big service providers that, uh, that are supported by state government uh, and that uh, if, there's a, if there's more big federal money coming to the states, that's a big if, and I think that'll be determined for 2020, you know, in the next month, and then it'll be determined again in the election in the fall about whether there's going to be a 2021 uh, effort, but uh, depending on how the election comes out, we can talk about that too. But uh, but but the big organizations, the big service providers that have stepped into what used to be government's role, will get funding if government steps forward and the money flows from federal government to state government to those service providers. But the small community-based organizations, the organizations that exist at the local level, the organizations that ex exist at the neighborhood level, the organizations that are really connected, Eric happens to run one of the best in New Haven, the organizations that are really connected at the, at the ground level, at the grassroots level to the people and, uh, that we're talking about, um, they're, not in that, they're not in that chain. They're not in that revenue stream. Uh, and the nonprofit sector uh, has to step forward and, and the nonprofit sector has the central role in supporting those organizations. Um, and there isn't enough money. There isn't enough money in the foundation world. There isn't enough money in the pockets of donors, however well-intentioned and however wealthy. Um, so very hard decisions are going to have to be made about how those resources get allocated. And we've tried in large measure, thanks to your leadership, Kalila, you know, we've been very, very uh, clear about wanting to reach new organizations and organizations that are, that are very connected to these populations. And as we think about uh, what our next phase is gonna be at the Community Foundation, and as you know from our recent board discussion, we're talking about potentially raising a lot more money and reaching into our endowments in a completely unprecedented way to pull out a lot more money, something we've never done before. Uh, a big part of that is gonna be how do we reach those organizations that the government flows won't reach? How do we reach those organizations that the donors don't know about and the big national foundations don't know about. That's a key role for 
community foundations in serving, in serving our community. You know, something that I've heard from all three of you is that uh, a lot of people romanticize going back to normal or getting things back to normal. And what I've heard from all three of you is the affirmation that normal was not working for large groups of people across our state and really across our nation. And as we think about this upcoming election and what it will mean, I want you to think about how we've learned about the challenges and diversity that exist within communities through this pandemic. So we talked about the, the support that's available from government, from nonprofits, from philanthropy. But what we also learned from this pandemic is that uh, undocumented immigrants were not eligible for many of those programs. So even those who had become business owners still faced this uncertainty. We talked about essential workers and frontline workers, but we didn't acknowledge that many of the people who were risking their lives to keep us safe, bus drivers and home health aides, were not earning a livable wage to even keep their family safe. So as we think about this upcoming election, we think about uh, some of the, the questions that voters and candidates will be forced to address to think about economic vulnerability. I wondered if each of you could name one or two things that you think we should be focusing on as something that we have learned from this pandemic. Eric, I'll, I'll call on you first. Just okay, that's, that's fine. I, I think we, we don't talk about and or think about wealth building enough. I, I think at the same time, CONCAT and CONCORP is a, trying to aggressively address and alleviate poverty. We are also trying to create levers of wealth building. And, and quite often, and, and even here, um, we insert the government and what the government can do, right? And the government stepping up, but the government historically has never stepped up for black and brown people or poor people, quite frankly, in a way that has gotten people out of poverty. I think the government does a great job of keeping people comfortable in poverty, quite frankly. And so I, I think we need to talk about, and we are thinking deeply and widely and strategically about wealth building and wealth generating in the black community in New Haven, quite frankly. Thank you. Will, well, what's something that voters and candidates should be thinking about from these lessons learned? Well, I think uh, because of COVID-19 and everything we're talking about, I think this country uh, is at a, is at a, a, a moment of change uh, that has potentially historic implications. I think there's a sense that, that all the systems are broken. None of them were up to the task of meeting the challenge of challenge of 2020. All the systems I think Will may be having some technical issues there. Will, we can't hear you. Will, you're, you're breaking up. There we are. So, Carla, I'm going to ask if you can mute Will so that he can log off and log back in. And, and thank you. Well, we're going to circle back to you because I want to okay. make sure that we get yep. that point as well. Yep. But yep. I'll, I'll go to Arunan. What is it yep. that you want voters and candidates to be thinking about as sort of lessons learned from this pandemic, charting the way forward that we should keep in mind? Yeah, I I think if if there's if there's one thing that I'd like people to focus on, I, it's, it's um, themselves and their, their role in the structures around them. And, you know, I think that uh, we have had a lot of conversations uh, with friends, with family, locally, nationally, uh, about the systems we have and whether there is uh, the benefit to those systems outweigh the massive cost of those systems. And, you know, I, I was, am a big, uh, fan of, of MLK's line that, that, that the three major sins we face are sin of racism, of poverty, and of war. And, and we're not confronting a war right now, 
but you know, I grew up in the church and I, I, I know how people approach sin. It's, it's something that you deal with internally and then push out into the world and deal with it in, in every form that it comes and, and dealing with a sin and, and whether or not you're religious, I think the metaphor is still important. Um, is it's something that seeps into each of our bones. Kareem abdul wrote this article right after the George Floyd killing, in which he talked about racism as this dust that's in the air. And you might not even see it, uh, even if you feel like you're choking from it, until people start to shine lights on it. Um, and we need to shine a light on, on these, these sins in our, in our society and, the, and these um, mistakes we have built and these structures we've built based on faulty foundations and, and our role in that and then our, our, the, the systems that have built, been built up around that and whether we want to continue those systems going forward. Because I think it's so easy to wet ourselves to a system and, and not really think about the value it brings. And, and I hope that we as individuals, we as voters, um, think about our role in those systems and, and whether we want those systems to exist. Mm -hmm. Reclaiming our power, affirming that sense of agency is so important, Arunan. And it is something that should never be thought of as partisan to yeah. think about what it means to affirm we the people to address these things. So I'm, I'm getting a signal that we have five minutes left. Talking to you three has been wonderful. So as we move to close, you know, before we got on the call today, I was watching the funeral services for Congressman John Lewis and had read the, the last letter that he wrote uh, that was published in the New York Times. And it was really a letter to young people, but to all of us. And so in that letter, he says, while my time has now come to an end, I want you to know that in the last days of, and hours of my life, you inspired me. You filled me with hope about the next chapter of the great American story when you use your power to make a difference in our society. Millions of people motivi motivated simply by human compassion laid down the burdens of division around the country and the world you set aside race, class, age, language, and nationality to demand respect for human dignity. So as we close out and as we embark on the way forward together, I'm going to ask each of you what gives you hope in this moment. And Will Ginsburg, we'll start with you. Well, I am very hopeful and I'm an optimist by nature. Um, and I believe for all its faults and for all its missteps, I believe in, in the people of this country, young people and, and all people. And I believe in the system that we created 200 and almost 250 years ago. So I am hopeful because I think that, uh, you know, I describe the moment that we're at as a country, you know, are we going to, are we gonna move forward? Is this the last gasp of the reactionaries and the defenders of the status quo? Or is this the last gasp of our democracy and our system? And I believe that the American people wanna move forward. I believe that there is a positive momentum for change, for fundamental change, for reestablishing the role of government in meeting the, the needs of people, in, in, in changing race relations in this country in fundamental ways. Um, I feel this, this energy and uh, it's coming, as I said, very much from young people, but not entirely from young people. So I, I feel that for all the despair and need that's out there and I confront it every day, uh, this is a hopeful moment. And it happens to coincide with a big decision that the American people have to make in, November, in the first week of November. So I'm hopeful that, uh, that the positive energy for change will prevail and that 2020 in the end will be seen as a, as a watershed moment when we decided to move forward and confront the things that bedevil us and not sink into some uh, dark mire of, uh, of division. And I'm, I'm, uh, I'm hopeful that's gonna happen and I'm actually predicting it's gonna happen. Thank you, Will. Arunan, what's giving you hope as we move toward the way forward? Um, yeah, I, you know, John Lewis is such a hero of mine, and he was my congressman when I was in college. And uh, and and you can you know you could still feel later in life the cracks in his head, skull, um, and those cracks really paid for my rights. Uh, and and I was never able to the few times I met him say that in words that that could contain the level of that. Um, but when John Lewis marched, it was such a courageous thing because you forget 
how few people were on his side. I think we've sanitized that history. Um, and uh, Dr. King and, and Don Lewis and um, Vivian and, and uh, Bernard Rustin, and those guys, you know, they, they were very much alone. They sat in jail cells alone. There weren't, there weren't, you look at those pictures, there weren't a ton of white folks marching with them. Um, and there are so many more people now who are joining in these protests, so many more voices who are listening to this truth that I think black folks in this country uh, have had uh, at, and, and been prophetic about for so long, so many generations. Um, and that is what gives me hope. It's, it's that this truth is expanding um, and growing. And, and you know, if you, if, you, uh, if you look around, I think that there are, there are, there's such a, a difference in this next generation and the way in which they approach the world. And I think the, the, the greatest lie we've told ourselves, it's so important that, uh, that what happens in this next election uh, changes the outcome of our nation in the short term, right? It, it's this, I, I'm not of the mindset, I don't have the privilege of believing that the two parties are the same. I think it has really major impacts on where we go. But I think that, that, that we won't buy into this mindset that just voting for a candidate at the very top who, who ascribes to our platform or our beliefs is gonna change the world. I think we have started to come around and grasp the reality that it's gonna take real change, fundamental systems change. Um, and, and there's no way we can do that uh, unless we, we reimagine the way in which we approach the world around us. And I, I see that happening. Um, and I'm, I am like Will tremendously hopeful um, because of the voices that have emerged in, in, in the last few years. Thank you. Eric Clemens, what's giving yeah. you hope? Um, one, I, I always believe that if, if I could, if the Lord wakes me up in the morning, then I have a shot, right? So I'm over, always and ever hopeful. Um, I'm very much like Will, that is just in my bones. It is, it is a part of who I am. Secondly, I think most importantly, I, have, I am watching and sitting with white people for the most part who have benefited again from this system of oppression, from racism, from privilege, who are now showing the courage to truly interrogate themselves, interrogate the systems that have benefited them, and are even in their discomfort, they are now running towards the trouble, asking what they can do to redeem the suffering of people who have been suffering historically. And so in that fight with those people, which is so very different, right? Because you know, people would shirk when, when I would mention race or, or white and black and, and those things. But now people are inviting those conversations, are asking about my thoughts and, and, and my, my philosophies, and even trying to add to it based on their experiences. And so the courage that I am seeing to run to the trouble, to help people and redeem the suffering of people who have been suffering throughout history gives me great hope and, and really gives me joy. And I'll, I'll finish with my favorite scripture in, in Romans 5, where Paul says that tribulation gets you patience and patience experience and experience hope. And I think that kind of continuum to get to hope is what we are living in right now from tribulation to hope. Will Ginsburg. <laughs> Arun and Aralampalam and Eric Clements, thank you for helping us think about the way forward and how we do it together. I want to thank the president of Quinnipiac University, Judy Olean, for sponsoring this president speaker series. And I certainly want to thank our staff who's making things run behind the scenes and thank our audience for joining us today. This podcast and a replay of the broadcast will be available next week. I'm Dr. Kalila Brown-Dean. Thank you all for joining us. Be well done, Doc. Thank you. Well done. Thank you. Thank you. Well, Aronin, good to see y'all. Thank, Thank you very you. much, all. It was great to see you.